In November of 2007, 35 members of a fanatical religious group in Russia's Penza region gathered up supplies and made their way down into a cave. They had been sent down into the cave on the orders of their leader, a 43-year-old man named Pyotr Kuznetsov. Pyotr told his followers that they were God's chosen ones, and in order to survive the coming apocalypse, they were to remain inside the cave. Among their supplies were several cans of gasoline, and the cult members warned authorities that they would blow themselves up if anyone attempted to remove them from the cave. So, Russian authorities and local priests camped out near the cave for months, helplessly watching and waiting for the members to come out. And for six months, the world watched in disbelief as the cult members endured freezing temperatures, floods, structural collapses of the cave, and starvation. And even then, some remained. In the end, it would be the death of two of their own members that would finally force them out. And Father Piotr would be exposed as nothing more than a false prophet suffering from severe mental illness. Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Summer Sanchez. And on this channel, we talk about crime, cults, and heinous history. So if that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you never miss an upload. So a little disclaimer here before we get started on this one, this case has been recommended to me I can't even tell you how many times. And I've put off covering this one because there just aren't a lot of details out there about this cult. There was a ton of news coverage during the six months that this cult was inside of the cave, but there isn't a lot known about them leading up to them actually going down into the cave. And I'm sure that that's why it really isn't covered much here on YouTube, but I basically devoured every single news article, all of the news coverage that I could find to bring you guys a pretty good look into what actually happened with this cult. So yeah, this is the story of the Russian cave cult, also known as the True Russian Orthodox Church. But before we get into the case, let's go ahead and briefly talk about today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by June's Journey. I love a good, relaxing mobile game. A game that allows me to unwind and escape the stress of life for a bit. And June's Journey is one of my all-time favorite games to play when I want to relax. The game is set back in the 1920s and it centers around Detective June Parker. When June learns about the death of her sister and her brother-in-law, she makes the journey from London back to her her childhood home in New York. And pretty much the moment she arrives, she knows that something's not right, and she finds herself right in the middle of a murder investigation. You'll follow June throughout her journey to learning the truth about what happened to her sister and her brother-in-law, and along the way, you'll meet so many interesting characters. And these characters will help guide you and help you unravel the mystery and unlock some pretty shocking family secrets. Each of the levels has a list of hidden objects that you'll need to find in the scene, and as you clear the levels, more and more of the story will unfold. And not only are you solving a murder mystery, but you're also customizing your mansion and fixing up your garden. You can add things like fountains, flowers, and fencing to your garden, and there are so many ways for you to update your mansion. And the levels are absolutely stunning. The artwork is beautiful, and I just love the music as well. You can tell that the creators of this game really took their time putting in so much detail to each scene. I've been playing June's Journey for years. I play a lot when I'm like outside relaxing, if I'm enjoying a cup of coffee or tea, or when I'm just trying to take a a mental break for my research. It's so fun and relaxing and it's very charming. I just absolutely love this game. And if you want to try out June's Journey for yourself, you can click the link in my description box or you can scan the QR code on the screen to download June's Journey for free. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices as well as PC through Facebook games. And if you do decide to try out June's Journey, please consider using my link because it really does help out this channel. Thanks again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video and now let's jump into the case. Pyotr Kuznetsov was born in 1964 in Russia's Penza region, and literally all we know about his childhood was that his family was very, very religious, and they were members of the Russian Orthodox Church. Some of Pyotr's classmates have described him as a good kid. He was described as funny. One former classmate said that he was always telling funny stories, and from what I could tell, he just seemed like a typical kid. Pyotr went to college at the Penza Civil Engineering Institute, and he obtained two degrees, and he got a job as an engineer after he graduated. He went on to get married and he and his wife had one son and that's really it for a while. Nothing significant happens for a while after this that we know of. But by the time Piotr was in his early 30s, he started looking for a change and he completely threw himself into the church. He became even more devoted to his Russian Orthodox faith and it was also around this time that he and his wife split up. I don't know what happened to cause the divorce. Some sources say that Piotr just up and left his family. Other sources say that his wife and his son left him. I'm not really sure 
what happened, but we do know that after they split up, Pyotr quit his job as an engineer and he became a monk in the Russian Orthodox Church. But at some point, Pyotr's beliefs started to become more radical. He became obsessed with the Bible and he would pick apart each and every word and he started to interpret scriptures in his own unique way. And he started writing his own religious books and he would use these books as a way to get people over to his way of thinking. According to people who have actually read Piotr's books, they contained a lot of hateful language and hate towards other religions and races. And actually at first, Piotr would hand these books out at church when he was still involved with the Russian Orthodox Church. A woman named Maria spoke to a journalist and she actually knew Piotr since childhood. And she said he would go to church and meet people and start to indoctrinate them. He wrote books and he would hand them out. I had some of those books, but I threw them away. And remember he was a monk in the church. So he was just like passing along this hateful extremist ideas to the parishioners. Then in 2004, Pyotr asked the archbishop for permission to build his own church, his own Russian Orthodox place of worship. But this request was denied. We don't know exactly why it was denied, but we can assume that the leaders in the church started to hear about these books that Pyotr was passing out. They probably started to notice that he was changing, that his ideas were changing. They probably did not want him representing their religion and running his own church. And so his request was denied. And Pyotr did not like this at all. This likely sent him spiraling even further down this like dangerous delusional path that he was on. And now he had a bit of a vendetta against the Russian Orthodox Church. He probably felt a little betrayed by the church. He had quit his job as an engineer to become a monk. He had devoted his entire life to the church. And when he asked them for a favor to let him build his own church, they said no. So eventually Pyotr hit the road and he started traveling all over Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, preaching his own fanatical version of the Russian Orthodox doctrine. And he brought a lot of copies of his books with him. And his sole mission was to recruit his own followers. And by the end of this recruitment tour, he had gained about 35 very devoted followers. Now, after this case broke, those books were deemed illegal by the Russian government. So most, if not all, of the books have been destroyed at this point, which is a good thing because you don't want radical, hateful, harmful literature circulating and potentially causing a repeat of what happened back in 2007 and 2008. But it really sucks from a research perspective because those books held the answers to a lot of questions that people still have about this cult to this day. So because of this, we don't know exactly what Piotr was teaching his followers, but at least one member did speak to journalists after this case broke and he gave some insight into Piotr's teachings. This man's name was Sergei Nedigon and he was 22 years old and his mother and father and his two younger sisters who were only 15 and nine were all members of the cult. Sergei was different from the other members though. He actually wanted to speak to the media. The others were very secretive and reclusive, but he felt like it was his duty to spread their message to more and more people. And he thought a great way to do that would be to speak to the media. So Sergei started talking to journalists and he said that Pyotr had first recruited his father, who was a man named Vitoli. And Sergei said that when his parents first got involved with Pyotr, he was totally against it. He said that he did not believe anything that Pyotr was teaching his parents, but then he started reading his books and he would compare those books to the information from the Bible. And he said, everything matched up. He said everything in Piotr's books could be backed up by what was written in the Bible. And so he eventually joined the cult as well. Sergei said that Father Piotr, which is what they called him, they called him Father Piotr, told them that barcodes and passports, tax IDs, social security numbers, basically any identifiable number was evil and they contain the mark of the beast. Piotr had a bit of an obsession with numbers and most of his theories came from his fixation over the number seven, any multiple of seven, the number 12, and of course the number 666. He made his followers burn their passports and any other type of ID that they had. They were not allowed to eat any processed foods. They weren't allowed to eat anything that had like a barcode on the box because that was seen as evil. And in 2004, the Russian Orthodox Church was given a tax ID number by the government and Pyotr saw this as the downfall of the church. In his eyes, they were no longer a true Russian Orthodox church. They were now fraternizing with the devil. And this tax ID situation was actually the thing that inspired Pyotr's doomsday prediction. Sergei said, there is a number in the Bible. After the church, our Orthodox church betrays Jesus Christ, 1300 evenings and mornings will pass. This could be either seven years if you count full days. And if you count half days, then three and a half, which would be spring of 2008. Pyotr Kuznetsov took fragments from the Bible and proved all of this. So Piotr came up with this theory
theory that the apocalypse would occur in May of 2008. He and his 35 followers started living in this house. They called it the prayer house in the village of Nikolskoy, which I might be pronouncing wrong. If so, I am sorry, but it's a village in the Penza region of Russia. And some of these followers had moved all the way from Ukraine and Belarus just to devote themselves to Pyotr's teachings. They believed that he was a prophet, but in reality, Pyotr was suffering from undiagnosed schizophrenia and his views seemed to get more and more extreme as time went on. Family members of the followers have said that their loved ones were all just living normal, everyday peaceful lives before they met Pyotr. And once they met him, he hypnotized them and they completely changed. Pyotr was on a rapid decline mentally and he took 35 innocent people down with him. And four of those 35 people were children. The members ranged in age from 85 to only one year old. He convinced his followers to sell their homes and all of their possessions and give the money to him. One of the family members said he would go to people's houses, the rich houses, not the poor people's houses. And he had some kind of hypnotic power. They sold their homes, whatever they had, and gave all their money to him. Piotr also preached a natural lifestyle. They would grow their own food. Nothing could be processed, like I said. They were not allowed to use electricity. They couldn't watch TV. They had no access to the internet, no radio, no cell phones. He said all of this was evil. Pretty much anything that could connect the followers to the outside world, to outside information, Piotr said it was evil. The children were not allowed to go to school and they all cut off communication with their families and friends. This was of course how he kept them so far under his control. He became their sole source of information. He became the only connection they had to the outside world. So Piotr controlled all of the information that the cult was given and they weren't allowed to speak to any of the villagers either. The villagers would later say that they would see the cult members dressed in long black robes, just silently roaming around the village. And by 2007, Piotr was claiming to hear constant messages from God and God was telling him that he needed to move his people underground. Piotr said, local drunks beat up our men and swore at our women and God showed us the only path to move underground. According to Piotr, he and his people were being persecuted for their beliefs, but we don't even know if this is true. If they were actually being beaten by the other villagers or if this was just more of Piotr's delusions. But by the summer of 2007, Piotr had given the orders for his followers to dig out a large cave on the side of a ravine near the Volga River right outside of the village. The cult members worked day and night for nearly two months digging out the cave. The cave was 50 meters in length and the ceiling of the cave was only tall enough for an adult to stand upright. It was built in the shape of a circle and there were five rooms, which really were just like five little nooks dug into the side of the cave. And they had one large common room in the center that they called the prayer room. They had a little makeshift kitchen and a toilet and they also dug out a little well so they could access water. They dug a couple of holes out of the top of the cave, like out of the ceiling, and they placed ventilation pipes in the hole for some fresh air. And they would also use one of the holes as like a chimney. They stocked the cave with supplies like rice and grains and honey. They also brought in water and over 100 gallons of gasoline. And the gasoline actually served multiple purposes for the cult members. They could use it for cooking and heating, of course, but they also planned to keep authorities from stepping in and trying to force them out by threatening an explosion. And this actually wasn't just a threat. According to some of the members, they were 100% prepared to blow themselves up if anyone tried to force them out. And on November 7th, 2007, 35 members made their way down into the cave and keep in mind the ages of these people. The oldest person in the cave was 85 years old and the youngest was only one. There were actually four children total that were brought down into the cave to wait out the apocalypse. And they also brought a parrot down in the cave with them. But guess who did not go down into the cave? Father Pyotr Kuznetsov. He told his followers that he had another destiny, but that they should go down into the cave and stay there no matter what until the end of the world. He told them that they were the chosen ones and only the chosen ones were allowed down into the cave. And he promised them that once they had all survived the end of the world, they would be given the authority to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. They would become the judges in the aftermath. They would be given this supreme authority to determine determine the fate of others. And so while his followers lived in a cold, dirty, cramped cave, Piotr continued to live above ground in the cult's prayer house. And also just keep in mind that this was all happening during winter in Russia. So there was snow everywhere and the temperature was near freezing. So after about a week or so, the villagers were starting to wonder where the cult members had gone. Like I said, they would see them roaming around the village and they started to realize that they hadn't seen them in a while. And by November 16th, the villagers had realized that the cult members were actually under 
underground, and once they realized that, they went straight to the police. Russian authorities did attempt to reason with the cult. They tried to talk them into coming out, but nothing they said worked. And the cult members warned police that they had a lot of gasoline down there and they were prepared to blow themselves up if anyone attempted to force them out. And the authorities were really worried that they would accidentally do something to set the members off and they didn't want to be responsible for pushing them over the edge and potentially causing a tragedy, especially since there were young children down in the cave. So authorities set up a 24 hour observation post close to the cave and they just watched and waited. They would occasionally attempt to reason with the cult. They brought in priests and monks from the Russian Orthodox Church to try and reason with them as well, but nothing worked. The followers actually told the monks and the priests that they were the true Orthodox Church and they were waiting on God to rescue them from lawlessness. The cult members stayed in pretty much constant prayer. They would fast for several days at a time. They also took a vow of silence. So eventually, anytime they would respond to the people on the outside, they would only respond in song or they would pass notes through the ventilation pipes. They didn't want anything from the authorities. They just wanted to be left alone. Their only request was that they be left alone so they could just stay down in the cave and pray. They said they didn't want any help and they definitely didn't want the media there, but so many news outlets showed up from all over the world. Everyone was captivated by this super bizarre cult and they were showing up in droves. And having all of this attention was like a nightmare for them. They just wanted to pray alone in peace, which would have been totally fine if these were just consenting adults who went down into a cave to pray, you know, whatever. But when you subject children to that, you're gonna have a problem. The doomsday drama has shaken the remote village of Nikolskoye in central Russia, where the cults, houses and makeshift churches were abandoned. Residents told us they're shocked their neighbors have gone underground and taken at least four children with them. I only worry about the kids, says Nikolai. The adults can decide for themselves. And the authorities must decide too to wait it out or risk storming the cave and those inside making good on their suicidal threat. The children cannot consent. They were being forced to take part in something they really didn't understand. And the authorities had to worry about what was really going on down in the cave. Did the children have enough food? Were they being taken care of properly? Were they in danger? Also, the rainy season would be coming up soon in the spring and snow would start to melt. Floods were pretty much imminent. So there was also this risk of people drowning down there or just the cave completely collapsing. During Sergei's interview with journalists, he said, people think we forced the children down there. I'll I'll tell you what happened. My sister, who you just saw now, when we were sitting on the gas canisters because the special forces had started to dig, she went up to our mother and said, don't worry, there will be an explosion and then we'll all be with God. I am assuming that he was talking about his nine-year-old sister. Can you even imagine yourself at nine years old being so brainwashed that you're just totally at peace with the idea of being blown up? So anyways, the police decided to install a microphone in the ventilation pipes so they could at least hear what was going on down there. And at one point they heard the cult members screaming because one of the children accidentally knocked over a candle in the prayer room and a fire broke out. The authorities immediately offered help. They wanted to assist them in any way they could, but their offer was rejected and the cult members managed to put the fire out without anyone getting hurt. The people on the outside were constantly offering to send down supplies. They asked if they could send down some food Food, some clothing, some hot water so that the children could take a nice bath, but all of this was rejected. And towards the end of November, a few more members arrived in the village. Two women and three children had traveled from Belarus to join the cult. And on November 22nd, Pyotr Kuznetsov, along with the two women and the three children, locked themselves inside the cult house. They actually locked themselves inside of a small room inside the house, and it was reported that the adults would take turns sleeping inside of a coffin. Now, authorities really needed to know the names of the people inside of the cave. They really wanted to reach out to their families. You know, maybe they could convince them to come out of the cave. So police went to the cult house and they demanded that Piotr give them the names of all the people down in the cave, but he refused. And since he refused, he was arrested. The police hated to admit it, but they actually needed Piotr. They needed him to convince the cult members to come out of the cave. And I don't know how authorities got Piotr to agree to help them. Maybe there was some physical 
persuasion, maybe some threats. I don't know, but he did agree to go down and talk to the people in the cave and try to get them to come out. So Piotr, along with some officers, went down to the cave. They didn't go inside. Piotr just spoke to them through the ventilation pipes, but he was trying to talk them into coming out. But the cult members were refusing to speak, even to their own leader. So they were just sending notes back and forth through the ventilation pipes. And by the end of this attempt, the situation somehow got worse. The followers flat out refused to come out. And now they believe that Piotr was under the influence of the Russian government and they could no longer trust him. They didn't abandon him though. They still thought of him as the prophet, but they were now convinced that Piotr was only telling them to come out because he was being forced to by the Russian government, which... To be fair, that was exactly what was happening. So for the time being, they needed a temporary leader and they chose Sergei's dad, Vitoli, which was not a good thing because Vitoli seems a little unhinged, which we'll talk about later. Now, even though he gave in and he helped the authorities, Pyotr was not off the hook. He was still being charged for creating a violent religious organization, but the authorities could also see that he was not mentally well. So he was taken to a psychiatric hospital in Penza where he was evaluated and it was then that he was finally diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Already the self-styled leader of the sect who ordered his followers into the cave is in police custody undergoing psychological tests. Pyotr Kuznetsov, or Father Pyotr as he's known, told Russian television he hadn't gone inside himself because he was waiting for more people to save. But even after this diagnosis came out, the cult members are being told, you know, your leader is a false prophet. He is not mentally well. This had no effect on the cult members whatsoever. The two women and the three children who had come over from Belarus, the ones who had been living in the house with Piotr, they were deported back to Belarus and they were not happy. One of the women said, the government's actions will be accounted for. And if authorities try to evict the people underground, then God will punish them. The biblical prophecy is coming true. The world will soon end. And so this is how things stayed for months. The cult members remained down inside the cave. Authorities, medics, priests, monks, journalists, relatives, they all remained close by day in and day out with no sign of anyone coming out. Now, by the end of March, 2008, the cult members had now been down inside the cave for nearly five months. And the authorities were starting to get desperate because they knew that once the snow started to melt, it could potentially be fatal for the people people in the cave. They knew that flooding could happen. A mudslide could happen. So once again, they decided to take Piotr down to the cave. They think, you know, maybe he'll have luck this time. Maybe he can convince them to come out. But not only was this attempt completely unsuccessful, but Vitoli Nedigon, their temporary leader, he started firing shots from a rifle through the ventilation pipes. No one was injured, thankfully, but you see what I mean when I said he was kind of unhinged. So this was another failed attempt, but they tried again on March 28th, and this time it actually worked. Piotr spoke to the followers and he actually did end up convincing seven women to come out of the cave. And they brought two of the children with them, including the one-year-old. Now, in order to convince the women to come out, authorities struck a deal with them. They agreed to come out only if they were allowed to live in their old prayer house, the cult house, with father Piotr. So authorities did reluctantly agree to these terms. The women and the two children, they came out and Piotr was allowed to leave the hospital and they all moved back into the cult house. And then just as they predicted, the rain started. The sudden downpour of rain coupled with the water from the melting snow caused a mudslide and the excess mud was falling into the cave. And the cult members had been desperately trying to reinforce the walls of the cave in the days before the rain started, but whatever they did, it did not help because large Large pieces of soil and rocks were falling inside the interior of the cave. Some big chunks of soil actually blocked off the well, so now they had no water supply. The cave was literally falling apart, and some of the members decided that it was time to go. So on March 31st, 2008, 14 more members left the cave. They were checked over, and they were released. And so now there were only about 11 cult members remaining, and it is now early April, and Piotr's predicted apocalypse is fast approaching. But then something pretty unexpected happened happened on April 3rd. Piotr attempted suicide. He was found in horrible condition. He had apparently laid his head down on a plank of wood and then used another piece of wood to bash his own head in. Some people believe that he did this because he knew the apocalypse wasn't actually coming and he was running out of time and he was just trying to escape everything. And some people believe that this wasn't a suicide attempt at all. His followers believe that he had actually been attacked and killed by authorities and he had then risen from the dead. According to Sergei, Father 
Father Piotr was left for dead, but when they came for him in the morning, he was lying there whispering something, praying. Piotr was dead and he rose from the dead. No one believes this, but it is written that when the prophet is killed, no one will believe it. And this is what happened. Piotr was taken to the hospital and he had to undergo surgery and the doctors really didn't know how he was gonna function if he even survived. And he actually ended up in a coma for a week after the surgery, but he eventually woke up and he spent a month in intensive care and he ended up making a full recovery. And then he was readmitted back into the psychiatric hospital. By early May, the remaining 11 followers had managed to redig the well. So they now again had access to water and they had also changed the apocalypse date from May 28th to sometime in June. It just seems like they were floundering at this point. The cave is falling apart around them. There has been zero sign of the coming apocalypse and authorities weren't positive, but they highly suspected that at least two of the cult members were dead. They could actually smell the stench of decaying flesh coming from the ventilation pipes. And on May 16th, 2008, more than six months after they first went down into the cave, the last of the remaining cult members finally came out. And it wasn't because they had finally seen the light and realized that the apocalypse wasn't coming. It wasn't because the cave was literally falling apart around them. It wasn't even because they missed their loved ones or that their leader was begging them to come out. They finally left the cave because two of their members had in fact died down in the cave. One woman had cancer and she passed away. She spent her final days in a cold, dirty cave in silence away from her family and friends. And it was all for nothing, all because she got mixed up with a very sick individual. And another woman died from starvation. She had been on an extended fast for weeks and she literally starved herself to death. The women had been dead for a while and the cult members had buried them in the prayer room, but the fumes from their rotting corpses started to fill the cave and the remaining members were getting sick from the lack of fresh air and constantly breathing in the stench of decaying flesh. And so that's what finally drove them out. The bodies were exhumed and after autopsies were performed, they were given to their families for proper burial. And the last of the cult members joined the others in the prayer house and they waited for the apocalypse to come. Even after everything they had been through, they still believed that the end was coming either at the end of May or June. The government gave them a cow so that they would have access to milk since, you know, they wouldn't drink anything or eat anything with a barcode. And the people who lived in this village lived in poverty for the most part. So this kind of pissed off some of the other villagers. One local woman said that maybe they should all go live in a cave and maybe they'll get a cow too. And after a very extensive investigation, the cave was deemed unfit for human habitation. The cult members and their children were living in absolutely horrendous conditions. And this really grossed me out, but they had dug their well where they were getting their drinking water right next to where they had dug out their toilet. Eventually the cave was destroyed to prevent anyone from trying to recreate the events. And it was also just plain dangerous. It was not structurally sound. So the authorities blew up the cave with explosives. Charges against Piotr were being pursued by the prosecutors for creating a violent organization. And in July, 2008, a hearing was held in the psychiatric ward where Piotr was staying. And this hearing was solely to determine if he was well enough to stand trial. In the end, the court decided that Piotr was in fact much too mentally and physically ill to stand trial. So the court proceedings were then moved to a regular courthouse. So now the trial would go on without Piotr present. And the main question during this trial was, was Piotr Kuznetsov sane at the time he ordered the followers down into the cave? There was no doubt that he was suffering from severe mental illness at this point. He had already been deemed legally insane, but was he legally insane back when he ordered the cult members to go down into the cave? And in the end, the court decided that Piotr was legally insane at the time he ordered his followers into the cave. And so the charges were dropped. Piotr was ordered to remain in the psychiatric hospital for treatment. And after all of the predicted apocalypse dates had passed, the members who had been hiding in the cult house finally started to trickle out and they would be seen walking around the village again. And there were reporters right there waiting to catch a glimpse of them and to try to get a statement. Many of the cult members had stayed completely silent through all of this and people really wanted to hear from them. And when they finally decided to speak to reporters, one of the members said, there's no need to teach us. We can confirm every word by the scriptures. The end of the world is coming, though it might take three more years for it to finally die. And as far as I can tell from my research, the last update that we have on Piotr was from back in 2011. In 2011, Piotr was trying to get permission from the courts to continue his treatment as an outpatient, but that request was denied. And that was really the last update that I could find on him. So for all I know, he's still alive and he still remains in the psychiatric hospital.
hospital. And there are reportedly still members of the cult still practicing in the village to this day. And that is all I have on the Russian cave cult case. If you find this type of content interesting, please consider subscribing, leaving me a comment and liking this video. That is the easiest way for you to support me and my channel. Don't forget you can download June's Journey for free by clicking the link in my description box or scanning the QR code on the screen right now. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching and I will see you next time.